Hi, my name is Dr. Molly Faulkner, and I am taping this for you today in the policy class because I'm on annual leave and was unable to be there in person. We're going to talk about lessons from the field, behavioral health workforce development in New Mexico from 2014 to 2022. I'll be speaking about those years because those are, uh, for the last eight years, I've worked for the Division of Community Behavioral Health in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of New Mexico as the Clinical Director of the State Behavioral Health Workforce Initiative. I've been heading up the Behavioral Health Workforce Development for the department, but uh, in a larger sense for the State of New Mexico in our work with Behavioral Health Services Division in Santa Fe. Before we get into talking about the workforce in its entirety and how we work with the, um, uh, behave, the state, I would like to speak to you about uh, June of 2013. In June of 2013, 15 of New Mexico's behavioral health agencies, public behavioral health agencies, had their Medicaid funding frozen by New Mexico Human Services Department, really due to alleged fraud. This left approximately 30,000 patients with mental health disorders at risk and without care. Some agencies um, literally shut down and their staff either left the field, the state, or simply went to work at a different behavioral health organization. And I'm telling you that they came in to, inter to audit these agencies and, the next, and shut them down on that very day, some of them. Um, it was a huge disruption to the care of these individuals and to the uh, providers themselves and the agencies because they were unable to get the care that they had already been getting for so long. And for some of these clients, they were uh, stable uh, and or as stable as they could be. And this intervention and shutdown left them without care. Additional information about the shutdown can be found here at this URL. And I really encourage you to read about it. Uh, it really had a profound impact on providers and the clients, and I just think it makes sense that you would read about it and read all the opinions that are out there. There's also a movie about the, sh the about this called The Shakeup, and it can be found for purchase uh, on Amazon.com and for rent at $2.99, which is not a lot, but I, it's an excellent movie and talks about the impact of this shutdown across the state. It's important to know that it took many, many years to actually have this investigated fully. And I would say, I believe uh, 14 of these agencies were cleared of all wrongdoing. Uh, and the one agency that had some issues about uh, fraud or supposed fraud, I don't believe they even called it that in the long run. But this really impacted the trust that New Mexicans had in behavioral health providers in New Mexico unnecessarily. It, and it also uh, betrayed uh, trust between clients and their providers. And lastly, providers themselves had a hard time in trusting uh, the state because they were worried that they might be uh, investigated at any time. The other impact that uh, we've had historically on the state is in 20, March 2020. In my life, this began in March 13th, 2020, because that is a date that I went home and worked in my home uh, as opposed to working in the office of the Division of Community Behavioral Health. Uh, this was the COVID-19 pandemic and it contributed to the already overburdened workforce resulting in intense moral distress and burnout. He, uh, the, the division actually conducted some groups for inpatient clinicians at UNM who were dealing with the death, dying and illness from uh, COVID-19 and were horribly, um, you know, they, they felt this horribly. They had a hard time uh, coping and had a hard time taking care of clients in the way that they knew they needed to be cared for because they were working so hard and so many overtime shifts. Um, and there was really nothing to be done about many of the clients and their illness and they died alone, often without family there with them. Another, um, not as much a historical impact, but just to give you an idea of the beginning. Uh, in July of 2014, um, I was hired uh, 
who, as somebody who actually had a couple of different uh, behavioral health professions under their belt, uh, to come to uh, the community behavioral health. I had little, little to no experience with policy, behavioral health services division here in New Mexico, nor in the vast number of communities across the state, rural, many rural and urban communities. Um, I was uh, hired into the role of clinical director of the state behavioral health workforce initiative. I had, up to that point, I had been a clinician and I had uh, worked primarily at programs for children and adolescents in the division and then was hired at Cimarron uh, Clinic at outpatient child uh, psychiatry at the Children's Psychiatric Center. Um, I was the assistant medical director there the last few years of my job and just was really not really like a fish out of water. Uh, I was asked to uh, become um, to develop a program of clinical supervision for master's prepared social workers across the state and also to write grants and to implement the grants and programs. Uh, I, I went from being in my own office every day meeting with families I'd known for almost some, some many, many years uh, to driving uh, to Santa Fe weekly to meet with Behavioral Health Services Division so that I could align our efforts at the um, Division of Community Behavioral Health with uh, the states for workforce development and to try to figure out how we can enhance the capacity and numbers of workforce to, to care for the individuals with mental health problems in the state. My heart was really with the provider. I um, <clears throat> had some knowledge about policy, of course, and certainly of larger needs within the state, but quite frankly, I was a provider and therefore, I, uh, in 2014, I did a driving tour of New Mexico to listen to behavioral health providers and their, and their needs after that 2013 shutdown. I also uh, did a focus group to determine why providers did not want to work within the public behavioral health system. They talked, they, meaning BHSD, talked a lot about why would people not want to work with us? Uh, they didn't understand the lack of trust uh, they had some ideas about it, but they weren't really sure what they were. So they asked me to uh, get a, do this tour and also understand, find out through focus groups why this had happened. Um, therefore, in I think 20, I uh, finally 2014, 2015 finished these focus groups, and they were originally done, like I said, to understand whatever barriers they felt that providers had. Uh, and working with the state behavioral health care system. I uh, invited participation, reached out to um, you know, psychology, social work, psychiatry, um, even nursing groups, and I did four in-person groups at that time, and I did two over video teleconferencing. At that time, Zoom did not exist, and video was the premier teleconferencing uh, program across the state. Um, I actually interviewed people and did focus groups with those that were working within and outside of the public behavioral health care system so that I could compare and contrast their groups. The themes that I was able to identify really began with a really caring and committed workforce to work with those who had behavioral health needs. There was a genuine desire within them to have a two-way communication to um, so they wanted you know transparency and, and and honesty so they could understand what the, the needs were and that so that they could provide those um, they could provide to meet the needs of these individuals there was considerable concerns from the behavioral health workforce so the people the providers themselves considerable concerns around liability and ongoing vulnerability to charges of fraud because this came out of the blue. Um, this audit came out of the blue and they were in 2013. Therefore, they were worried that there would, they would be charged again with fraud in the future. They felt overburdened um, in the system and they felt, they felt that the, uh, there was some confusion about what was needed and that what the what the responsibility was and they were um, also felt overburdened as providers. 
they felt that the system was unsustainable it's financially. Uh, they felt that there also was issues with education and training that uh, at the uh, higher education level, that they had issues with um, being trained on in areas that would help them once they got out of school and ongoing education once they were in the field. Um, it takes a lot to keep your um, um, to keep your knowledge up to date and also to um, be trained in these evidence-based practices that would most that would best meet the needs of the patients. Uh, both private um, and public practitioners reported difficulties accessing care coordination for their patients. Patients are dealing with complicated issues. These are not simple uh, clients with simple depression, anxiety. Uh, these were very complex clients dealing with, uh, with um, trauma um, uh, and diverse issues around um, and also social disparities and inequalities of care and abilities for people to receive such care in the communities. Special themes mentioned were limited services for adolescent females, lack of uh, detoxification and treatment programs, not only for adults, but for adolescents. And again, like I said earlier, complex trauma for clients with limited treatment resources. It's important to be able to access workforce data in the state. And this ever-changing data regarding the composition, the location, the capacity and characteristics of the behavioral health workforce, they've been obtained over the years in New Mexico from the annual New Mexico Healthcare Workforce Report. The uh, workforce reports can be found here at uh, this URL, and I really encourage you to, um, to look for them and read them. The 2021 report can be found at this, uh, web, at this URL. This is behavioral health workforce data that's collected regarding the professions, um, locations around the state, whether or not they take Medicaid or Medicare clients, et cetera. We obtain this information annually from a relicensure mandatory survey that you take that you take and you uh, before you're able to actually re, uh, obtain your license in the state. Survey results, as I said, are published annually, and this is a snapshot of the New Mexico Healthcare Workforce Committee's re annual report from 2021. These are published every October and also distributed to the Legislative Finance Committee here in New Mexico. It really is a rich data set. It highlights workforce capacity issues in New Mexico annually, and again, like I said, is updated annually. Findings um, indicate a dearth of behavioral health uh, professionals uh, to meet the needs of New Mexico's population and their unique needs. And then they talk about a lack of providers that are representative of the diverse population. We know that New Mexico has a complex uh, uh, mix and population of uh, Hispanic, Native American, uh, Anglo, and uh, African American population, not only um, also Asian population. And we know that our uh, providers out there do not really um, reflect the population of the state. And all that data is located here. Uh, nationally, we have lots of different databases and they can be found through um, all sorts of um, websites. Uh, so the how did this get established? Well, we had a Healthcare Workforce Data Collection Analysis and Policy Act. In 2011, this act was legislatively enacted to systemically survey, again, all state licensed health professionals to determine reasons for the healthcare shortage and address the shortage through policy. In 2012, the act was amended to transfer all this data to the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center, 
we are able to, um, through st statistics and our statisticians uh, like Tyler, uh, we're able to um, uh, an analyze that data. And the first report was reported in 2015, where we had almost 5,000 behavioral health providers complete the survey as a mandatory part of their license renewal. And I know that if you have a license, you've already done this. I certainly do it every uh, couple of years, not only for my social work license, but also for my nursing license and my nurse practitioner license. So since 2015, all licensed behavioral health providers complete this survey, like I said, as a mandatory part of their license renewal to inform our understanding of our workforce and, the, uh, and its needs. And not only do we have um, the health care workforce as a whole, but also there's a section regarding the behavioral health workforce in this uh, annual report. In um, 2018, Dr. Altschul and Dr. Bonham and I, along with uh, Farnbar, uh, uh, Reno, Lindstrom, Alonzo, Marston, Crisanti, Salvador, and Larson, uh, wrote a article on this uh, state legislative approach to enumerating behavioral health workforce shortages, lessons learned in New Mexico, and this was published in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine. We had several recommendations um, that we make in the state, not just this uh, workforce uh, report, but ev uh, excuse me, not just the article that we published for uh, but also there are recommendations made every year. And uh, recommendation number one was to incentivize community health centers, federally qualified health, qualified health uh, centers, and others to establish primary health care centers with hiring of behavioral health providers to maximize, interdis maximize interdisciplinary health care delivery, such as by adding, we added, um, collaborative care CPT codes to Medicaid to expand access to behavioral health in primary care settings. This is so that we can get together and talk in groups uh, and collaborate together with uh, patients on their care. Recommendation number two was to expand capacity of certified peer support specialists within the state behavioral health workforce. And um, this recommendation uh, that the Office of Superintendent of Insurance add peer support services as a covered benefit uh, for behavioral health conditions for all health plans in New Mexico. And part of that was to work with the New Mexico Credentialing Board for uh, Behavioral Health Professionals to include certified behavioral health providers in future workforce reports, including certified peer support specialists and certified peer, uh, peer support specialists. Also to expand the scope of um, services to be reimbursed by Medicaid. And to use the treat first approach to allow peer support workers to provide reimbursable services in emergency department settings so that they can deliver Medicaid services without a treatment plan. So these are uh, critically important policy initiatives that we enacted uh, or we re recommended they enact and the Legislative Finance Committee would look at these recommendations and then determine whether there was legislative support for them in um, the legislator, legislative, um, in, le in the legislator in the next legislature in the next year. So all of these recommendations are requested and then they determine whether or not they will enact them in the next legislature. Number three uh, for in 2021, the third recommendation was that Medicaid should provide reimbursement differential to providers and provider organizations offering services in languages other than English. Um, and that increase in the reimbursement go directly to the intending clinician as opposed to the agency. And recommendation number four was to develop a state certification process for qualified behavioral health interpreters uh, training uh, for monolingual English speakers on how to use interpreters. Uh, in 2021, the recommendation five was to expand the Rural Health Care Practitioner Tax Credit Program to encourage uh, rural health care practi 
entrepreneurs to come to rural uh, areas. This would include pharmacists, physical therapists, social workers, and counselors. This gives you a little bit of an idea of how we, the workforce and policy work together to enhance the, um, the capacity of the behavioral health care workforce. In the 2020 report, um, despite statewide um, efforts to increase the behavioral health workforce, they found that the total number of behavioral health clinicians in each category has remained remarkably stable actually since the 2016 report. I know that we have actually uh, been able to increase proportions of Hispanic psychotherapy providers compared to the data from, the, from 2016, so we know that that has actually occurred. It's also important to encourage diversity across all races and ethnicities with particular attention to prescribers who continue to be less racially and ethnically diverse than the broader behavioral health workforce. It's important to be able to speak to somebody who uh, represents who you are, your race, or excuse me, your ethnicity or race. And this is why it's important to um, broaden the support throughout the state. We found that practice location is shifting, uh, that psychiatric nurse specialists are now working in clinic settings as opposed to acute care settings. So we're finding that this is uh, occurring within the uh, clinic settings. And that the age of behavioral health workforce in 2016, that 26% in, in 2016, 26% of the prescribers were over the age of 65. And in 2020, that percentage had increased to um, 36%. This is important. Um, since the pandemic, for sure, we've had the great retirement, that lots of people are retiring from lots of different uh, areas of the workforce, but particularly in health workforce. And that recruitment is critical uh, to this issue if we are able to meet the needs of a behavioral health workforce in the state. That health information technology and electronic health record capacity has increased and that they, we need more collaboration and sharing information than we have um, ability to do so. Um, and it's important to be able to have an ability to um, provide telepsychiatry, teletherapy, psychotherapy, and to be able to meet the needs of the clients across the state. There are, there's new information that is to be collected and is starting to be collected in, regarding certified and credentialed providers, um, like we've talked about, peer support workers and community health workers in the state. When I began doing uh, behavioral health workforce in 2014, we didn't talk a lot about certified and credentialed providers. We were talking at that time about what master's level clinicians could and could not do in the state, as well as um, psychiatrists, um, nurse practitioners. Uh, so it's interesting how we, we've not been able to meet the needs of um, people in the behavioral health needs of people in the state. And they are now expanding and broadening what certified and credentialed uh, providers can do to help meet that need. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we do across the board uh, for workforce uh, development, behavioral health workforce development. And um, Dr. Larson at the UNM has a healthcare workforce committee, and I was able to run the subcommittee also known as the Behavioral Health Workforce Coalition uh, since 2014. Now Jen Panhorse, uh, LCSW, will be chairing after June 2022 because I am retiring from the workforce in July. We have, Jen is one of many um, individuals that work with me in workforce here at the uh, Center um, community of Community Behavioral Health, Division of Community Behavioral Health and um, she will be moving this measure forward and, and we'll do more with that now. 
Um, this particular committee is full of stakeholders, the behavioral health providers, psychologists, counselors, social workers, and psych mental health nurse practitioners, educators, uh, professional licensing boards. We currently have the psychology board chair and the counseling board chair, as well as the social work board chair on our committee. Uh, we also have New Mexico Primary Care Association, New Mexico Behavioral Health Provider Association, uh, New Mexico Hospital Association, and New Mexico Health Resources, which really help with uh, putting uh, new providers into the communities. They help with uh, recruitment and retention of providers. We meet quarterly, we problem solve a network with each other, we share information, and share concerns that people have across the state and we take action. We make recommendations. This is the most important aspect is that we make recommendations to the behavioral health workforce uh, section of that New Mexico healthcare workforce report that's out annually. Um, the impact of COVID upon our workforce has been great. As you all know, we've, there's a great deal of moral distress uh, that workforces that the workforce has suffered not being able to provide the kind of care for individuals and to provide the kind of holistic care in uh, during the pandemic has been really difficult. There's been a high level of burnout because of the complexity of our patients that we deal with in behavioral health and health care uh, burnout because you can't meet the needs in the way that you would like to burnout because there are not resources in the community. Only one behavioral health providers can, or only one individual, and they can only do so much. Um, <clears throat> I've seen a lot of increased complexity since I've been here in New Mexico since the 90s, and it's been hard, hard to meet those needs. There's been a great deal of furlough and layoffs in the middle of the COVID pandemic, and this has been hard because we haven't had enough to do the work as it is. Uh, there's been hiring freezes. <clears throat> <clears throat> and even though you know you need more people to help you plan and help you implement the um, care that needs to happen, uh, when there's a hiring freeze, it's hard to get a new person in that role. There's been a lack of workforce for people to draw from. And as I said earlier, there's been a retiring workforce, of which I'm one. There's been an expansion of telehealth capability, which has been really great to try to meet the needs, but when you don't have enough people, it's been hard to meet that need. This requires a different kind of technological knowledge. Uh, people that are entering the workforce now have more of that knowledge, but older uh, providers have not had it, and it has been a real struggle for some of them. This compounds stress um, of the behavioral health workforce um, because of COVID and because of this lack of knowledge and not having enough, no enough numbers. Um, there's been some solutions and some ch and to some of these ch and some challenges that we've had. Um, the behavioral health workforce development, uh, the team that we have at uh, Division of Community Behavioral Health has been in, has grown in the last few years. Thank goodness, because we have a lot to do to be able to meet the needs across the state. I personally have met regularly with BHSD on behavioral health workforce uh, division issues because we want to make development issues because we want to make sure that we are aligning our uh, goals with them and that we are listening to not only uh, the state, but we're listening to individuals across the state, whether it's northeastern New Mexico, northwestern New Mexico, central, uh, south, southern needs are quite different sometimes than northern needs. We work together on projects. Um, we have a committee, the Interdisciplinary Clinical Supervision Learning Community. Uh, I have been a huge um, advocate of clinical supervision in the state. Uh, I'll talk to you a minute about our Acts New Mexico program, but it's important that individuals uh, um, get clinical supervision and if possible to have interdisciplinary clinical supervision. So you understand how others work, other professions work within uh, helping uh, individuals with mental health issues and serious mental health issues. Um, I've initiated many programs within the state. Uh, just one of the programs has been the Access to Clinical Telesupervision New Mexico. This is a free program that was sponsored by, has been sponsored by Behavioral Health Services in New Mexico. 
a free program where we reach out to rural and interdisciplinary, uh, excuse me, rural and frontier areas in the state, and we offer that clinical supervision to master level, uh, primarily social workers. We're trying to open it up to uh, counselors, but until this year and until the COVID Emergency Crisis Act, they were not able to receive clinical supervision over telesupervision means. We um, run a program, a free program, over Zoom HIPAA compliance, a uh, teleconferencing program, where we do provide individual and group supervision to master's level uh, social workers. They must get, um, they must graduate from an accredited program and become a licensed um, master's social work worker in order to enter this program. And the program helps them become independently licensed in the state to provide, an, as an advanced practice clinical social worker, to be able to um, obtain their licensed clinical social work uh, license. Uh, <clears throat> this is very important because if they're able to uh, provide this, then they're able to assess uh, clients uh, at Medicare, uh, for Medicare and Medicaid. And um, we have thus far this, uh, at this time, we have gotten approximately, I would say, We've got about 44 clients that have actually come through this program. I may even have a slide on it for you here in a minute. We also have collaborated with other state level departments, such as higher education department. I worked with uh, Michelle Casillas at the higher education department a few years ago to compile a list of, of uh, practicum sites across the state. This has been a real issue, especially in rural and uh, frontier areas. Um, we write workforce development grants and uh, training grants. In uh, 2016, I did a grant called Rural Urban Health Professionals, uh, Professions Student uh, Training Grant for SBIRT, Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. We trained lots and lots of providers across the state. Uh, workforce, we also sit on committees. Uh, treat First, um, we sit on lots of different committees. We also sat on the Treat First initiative where we, instead of uh, doing an intake and then telling somebody they're going to have to wait a number of months until they can get in for um, therapy services, we, we, I sat on that committee. Also the rural, um, the RCOR New, uh, New Grow New Mexico grant, uh, it really works with getting a certified uh, and credentialed peers. Uh, uh, certified and credential providers, excuse me, in the southern part of the state to help to screen and work with individuals with substance use disorders. And just to provide consultation and expertise on workforce and clinical issues, this is ongoing in this in workforce development. It's a lot to do. It's a Sisyphean task to try to get all of this taken care of, let me tell you, because it's changing and, uh, and we just have not had enough workforce, uh, but we're always working on it and people are always have good ideas about how to meet the need. Um, these are just a few areas that we have had workforce needs and I would say recruitment is huge, Recruit, retention, uh, aging providers, funding sources, we don't, um, salaries are not uh, great in behavioral health and we're always trying to increase that. Also, just getting reimbursement for services, and this is what I'm talking about with funding. Clinical supervision, as I said earlier, I think that you need clinical supervision throughout your career. Uh, it's not smart to practice in isolation. Licensure reciprocity. I wrote a white paper a number of years ago about the critical nature of licensure reciprocity so that the workforce could be uh, move across the state if they needed to. Sometimes people need to move for jobs, but sometimes people just want to come to <clears throat> help in different parts of the uh, country with uh, teletherapy uh, becoming a huge boon in the country as well as um, telepsychiatry. It's important that we're able to have a portable license that we can take from state to state if we want to to help in other parts. Also with COVID we know that it, it was necessary to start seeing patients over teleconferencing um, and if you had a, if your license can uh, transfer across state lines, then you're better able to meet the needs 
where the need is actually happening. We know that when we've had national disasters, such as hurricanes or other issues, that the uh, workforce has had to be more flexible and be able to go from state to state. Uh, I also have really learned uh, these last eight years is that we really need a well-being plan for behavioral health providers. This ought to be a part of our state strategic plan. How can we help the emotional uh, health of our uh, behavioral health workforce to help keep them <clears throat> healthy and able to meet the needs of their clients? It's hard to do that when you're, feel, when you're suffering yourself with the moral distress that we talked about earlier and the burnout. We also need behavioral health training for current students and practitioners. Uh, we offer lots of behavioral health uh, training in our division and with, through the workforce. Um, right now, we have Michelle, um, Lisa Murad McCoy, Jennifer Panhorst, Amanda Brown, uh, Laura uh, Rombach, who are offering trainings. I have offered lots and lots of trainings throughout the years and in my career. But we need to help people know how to do evidence-based practice, but also how to do suicide assessments, suicide interventions, because we've had an increase in suicide in our country. We need more practice sites in rural communities to traditionally, uh, which are traditionally underserved areas. And as non-independently licensed counselors and social workers progress toward independent licensure, we need to meet regularly with independently licensed clinicians for two to five years, at least for social work, and much longer for other, in counseling, and much longer for other uh, providers. I also wanted to say one of the successes that we've had is that we were able to get House Bill 125 um, improved, um, it, uh, 125 passed, and it improved the reciprocity of licensure of, of master's level clinicians and of uh, psychologists uh, from not just five years to two years. So meaning that you need to be licensed in another state for a number of years, and then you are able to reciprocity, use reciprocity to come to this state. That's what that, that house bill is about. And also, again, like I said earlier, getting more credentialed and certified providers in the field. And telehealth psychotherapy and clinical supervision for counselors <clears throat> has been uh, another way to meet the needs of clients. I have set, talked a lot today. I wish I was able to be with you and ask, answer questions, but I really encourage you to, an, to ask questions of your supervisors that you're working with here at the division and in the Department of Psychiatry. Wanted to tell you that in 2017 and 2018 that our uh, CBH Behavioral Health Workforce Development Team developed and, and CBH developed and executed the New Mexico Behavioral Health Workforce Development Inaugural Summit. We brought stakeholders together across the state to build a broad-based workforce coalition for people to develop, uh, focus and develop and implement action plan toward achievable goals to enhance and build behavioral health workforce capacity within the state. In 2019, we did a National Association of Rural Mental Health Conference. And we, we do ongoing local, state, and national trainings, as I stated in the previous slide. We also do multiple monthly trainings uh, that were developed by the staff and faculty at the Division of Community Behavioral Health on CCSS, which is community, oh, clinical, clinical ah, community uh, coordinated support services and for ASAM for ASAM is the um, Addiction um, and Substance Abuse Medicine trainings that we help to, uh, that we hold to help practitioners determine uh, the best placement for their uh, person that has a, their client that has a substance abuse um, diagnosis. We train on evidence-based practice. We train on self-care and we train through uh, Indian Health Services Center for Telebehavioral Health Excellence. And just to let you know the rewards I have actually experienced um, in working in behavioral health workforce development is knowledge. I had no idea how um, all the professions work together to meet the needs of the patient. Uh, so I, and the knowledge of the community, love, knowledge of law, law knowledge of le the legislature and how we can help 
um, affect change. Uh, I learned how to be a problem solver. People would reach out to me and I learned how to help them solve their own problem, but also how to be a resource for them. Uh, I learned that behavioral health workforce uh, development is really a, a many faceted issue. There's so many different areas um, uh, you, that you can focus on, depending on what the needs are of your community or of the state. Uh, you can make large policy changes and impact change in the state with, um, when you work with workforce. And you can make an impact on behavioral health care. I've worked with the grant, New Mexico Grow Grant, for a number of years, and they're making an impact on behavioral health care. They're informing people what certified and credentialed providers can actually do in the workforce and for patients. Uh, they brought it back to the relationship, and that's what it is when you're working with patients, uh, <clears throat> especially when you have a peer support worker who has lived experience to work with them. And I've gotten to know New Mexico, uh, New Mexico's many diverse communities and have, and have people that I would call friends all around the state and who are really care about New Mexico. I've learned about the challenges in parts of the states and I've learned about the resources that we have and to help connect people and be a broker of services to help people in getting those workforce needs met. I wanted to thank you. I know this has been a bit of a dry presentation I wish I could be with you today and talk to you more about workforce. But if you have any questions, you can certainly reach out to my email. Uh, I am on leave, but I have been checking it periodically. You can also reach out to Lisa Murad McCoy or Jennifer Panhorse or Amanda Brown or Carly Bottom, director of the division, of our division. Uh, she and Deborah Altschul, who co-run our agency, can also tell you more about workforce. Thank you very much, and I wish you the very best in your careers and your professions. I know you're all going into behavioral health workforce, and I am excited. Hopefully, you'll stay in New Mexico after your training, um, but if you don't, you'll carry some of these ideas forward into the future as you work, in, as you work wherever you work in the country. Take good care. I wish you the best. <laughs>